111774, State of Kansas v. Denise Davey. Please the court. I'm Ryan Inger, uh, Appellate Defender Office. I'm here today on behalf of uh, the defendant and appellant, uh, Ms. Uh, Denise Davey. Uh, with the court's uh, permission, I would reserve two minutes for a rebuttal, please. Two minutes is granted. Thank you. I can start with a uh, brief factual recitation of, of the case. Uh, early morning, uh, June 26, 2013. Uh, Adam Hirsch, Nicole Carter, and Whitney Hirsch uh, attack uh, Dennis Davey with a baseball bat while he's sleeping in his bed in his home. Uh, fortunately, Mr. Davey managed to escape from his attackers. He flees into the street uh, where a neighbor renders assistance to him. Sort of simultaneous with his exit from the home, uh, three, uh, these th three individuals, Ms. Carter, uh, Mr. Hirsch, and um, Adam, Adam and Whitney Hirsch, I'm sorry, all uh, exit the home as well. Uh, Miss, all three of them are apprehended right there, pretty much at the scene. Uh, Ms. Carter is holding a phone, exclaiming that uh, Mr. Davey, in fact, was the one that was attacking her. Uh, Miss Davey, uh, notably, was not present at the scene when this occurred. Uh, she was visiting her mother uh, in Pleasant Hill, Missouri. Um, this, essentially, that same day, um, another, or could have been perhaps the next day, the following day, very recent to this event, uh, the mother of Mr. Hirsch and uh, uh, Mrs. Hirsch, Whitney and Adam, caused the police to report that she had thought she had overheard something about uh, Miss Davey saying that she had been attempting to poison Mr. Davey uh, by putting mercury in his sandwiches, um, and also that she thought that there was some, some sort of situation going on there. Um, that the police needed to be aware of, that, that she thought that he was trying to, uh, she was trying to find some way to kill her husband. Uh, eventually, she's arrested and uh, brought to trial. Um, they seize her cell phone, find a number of text messages. Um, ultimately, the jury uh, convicts her of attempted uh, first-degree murder as well as conspiracy to commit murder. Um, the primary uh, testimony here against her was offered by. Um, co-conspirators, uh, Mr. Hirsch and Mrs. Hirsch, as well as uh, Nicole Carter. However, they did not testify at the trial. Um, Miss uh, Hirsch, Miss Whitney Hirsch, did testify um, over counsel's objection concerning uh, the, the elements of the conspiracy, the arrangements, and the facts surrounding that. Um, Mr. Uh, Adam Hirsch and uh, Nicole Carter, neither of them testified at trial. Their testimony was admitted uh, their preliminary hearing testimony, excuse me, was admitted uh, without uh, any objection by defense counsel. Um, the only issue before the court, and what I've uh, argued in, in the brief and the petition, is that uh, the co-conspirator exception, uh, the district court erred finding that the statements of Mrs. Whitney Hirsch, as well as a number of other communications that were uh, exchanged involving uh, phone calls and text communications uh, between the parties here, Mr. Adam Hirsch, um, Mrs. Whitney Hirsch, as well as my client, um, Denise Davey. Uh, the district court erred in finding the, those were admissible under the co-conspirator uh, rule to the hearsay exception. Um, what I've argued in the brief is that um, Essentially, this court has discussed a number of cases and looked at a number of factual situations where generally the argument is usually, were these statements in furtherance of the conspiracy? Were these statements relevant to the overall plan? Um, what I've argued here is that uh, the court hasn't specifically sort of looked at what it, what it actually means or construed what it means to be a party, a third party, to the conversation at, at hand involving co-conspirators. Um, I've argued that that should be construed to, uh, to carefully to mean generally a party who's not part of the conspiracy itself. How does um, that even fit into the 
idea, why would that make it more trustworthy or a statement against interest if you required it to be a third party? It seems to me that it's a more cautionary uh, approach <clears throat> if it is a third party versus co-conspirator. Right. What if, I'm saying if you is have someone that has nothing to, to do nothing with to, that comes in and starts saying, exactly. well, I heard these people say all that, where's the trustworthiness in that? When you have uh, the whole idea behind co-conspirator exception is they're all in this together, they're the agents of each other, and right. that their statements against interest, penal right. interest. Right. Well, I guess what I would argue is that, obviously, they all have a very distinct incentive to say, well, here's, you know, to, to minimize my own role in, in what in, in the conspiracy generally, uh, usually these situations arise in where one of the co-defendants or all the co-defendants are, which would be the uh, like the last case would be the subject of a cautionary instruction on an accomplice. It could be right. Yeah. Um, so and that's I mean that's what I've argued for of course that 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 could that it's very difficult to always determine as well in these conspiracy situations like Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Hirsch, Whitney Hirsch, is in the in the room right before uh, she testified. They went to go attack Mr. Davy, and she claims to have heard that Nicole is uh, saying, "Don't worry, Mom, we're not going to kill you too." Um, and so, in those situations, it's very it hasn't been really argued as well. She's in the room; she's part of it. How can she be a third party? Um, she's still part of the conspiracy. And I guess that if I'm if, to answer your question, that there's that incentive for everyone to sort of minimize their, their conduct in, so if third party saying a detective, um, I know that I think it was, um, there's some Logson or Lodgins, a recent case that I know the, the state had cited, um, discussed that, well, here's a detective that overheard these statements from the, you know, and then subsequently a defendant do, asserts his Fifth Amendment privilege, um, you know, which is what happened in this case eventually. And then we've got, got issues with uh, determining who that third party will be. Um, this is the petition for review, and the Court of Appeals found that the actual uh, statute, uh, 6460 I-2, mm -hmm. has no requirement that it be a third party. Right, and, and that's what I'm looking at this you know, the five requirements, a, a couple of those uh, have been removed. Like, I think State v. Flynn uh, left it at four requirements, but um, removed the requirement that it must be, there's one of the, sta the statement itself must be made outside the presence of, of the defendant. Um, but generally, that you look at all of this court's case law, and one of the very first requirement under this exception, it says it must be by a third party. But it's not. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to, it's not in the statute. I'd agree. It's not explicitly. And, and I think the Court of Appeals panel was uh, to get around the their duty bound to follow the precedent, would have pointed to Bergstrom uh, and other cases where we have said, no, the statute says what the statute says, and we won't read language into it, and it doesn't say third party. Uh, which was, you know, a legitimate position. So how, how do you get around that uh, approach that we apply the statute as written, not as um, uh, not writing something else into it, not writing the third party requirement into it? Well, I think that that third party requirement, I guess, is that last, it's that last leg, sort of leg on the stool there. Um, I mean, there's that long... There's a long tradition of that being a requirement, and then it's there for for good reason. Um, what is that good reason? That's what, that's I, what I think is is that it, it disassociates the actual participants in the conspiracy. So so you have some uh, safeguard, as you're saying, against the, this sort of cautionary principle of mitigating what what we should know every conspirator will want to do once this thing is in. Uh, and once everyone's being charged with something, is somehow distance their, minimize their own responsibility. Um, I was merely present. Uh, I didn't participate in a way to see this thing uh, reach fruition. Uh, those are going to be the, the, the risks that are inherent and in that in cause reliability issues in those testimonies. And so I think that would be the good reason that that remains there and that, that it be construed to mean a third party, meaning not somebody, it's, it's incumbent upon the parties in the district court uh, to, to determine 
is this really a third party offering this testimony? And what I've argued and what I've argued before this court is in these situations, all this evidence that came in was directly from, especially Mrs. You know, Whitney Hirsch, when she's saying, you know, we're in, we're in this bedroom, we're going in to attack Mr. Davey, and I'm getting phone calls uh, where, you know, Nicole, I'm sorry, is getting phone calls from her mother at the same time, sort of directing and checking in on the operation. If we agree with the Court of Appeals and say that that's not a requirement under the statute, under the exception, mm -hmm. um, then uh, is Whitney's testimony uh, within that plain language, within 6460I, to specific plain language? I think there's... It's hard to take it as a whole, as a wholesale answer, Your Honor. I think that there's going to be components that would have to be carefully sort of parsed through. Um, this statement that I've complained about specifically, um, I know, Mom, we're not going to kill you too. I think there's probably other, I would have other objections to that if even in the absence of that third party. Okay, if, let, me, if you let me get down to the elements. The, okay. the party and the declarant were participating in a plan to commit a crime. Well, all, there's not much question about that. And relevant uh, uh, to the plan or its subject matter, and made while the plan was in existence and before its complete execution or other termination. I don't see that you're making an argument like the phone calls from the jail. Mm -hmm. What was what was left to be executed on the plan to kill? Right, uh, I think those. This the, man? Right, absolutely. That would fall. I'd probably have to make the argument there that that would fall under this idea of those are no longer in furtherance of the conspiracy. But, now, but I recognize, is, that, is that, do we have that issue before us? I mean, can we no, decide no, I, this I, case no. on, on the basis yes, that do. those uh, uh, phone calls from the jail uh, was after the completion or termination of the conspiracy? We, we don't really have that before us that we could decide on that basis. If we disagree that's, with your third that's, party. That's a fair statement. Okay. Yes. Um, I, I think with that being said, um, if unless the court has any additional questions for me, I'll go ahead and yield the remainder of my time. Any more questions? Thank you, counsel. <clears throat> May it please the court, Sean Minahan for the state. Um, The defense has set out the different uh, objections they made to the uh, statement by Whitney Hirsch um, and the text from Ad the defendant to Adam, Adam to Nicole, and then jail phone calls. Uh, I do want to point out uh, that the, I don't believe that the jail phone calls are part of the record on appeal. So I don't think that the defense uh, provided a sufficient record for this court to even consider the jail phone calls in this case. Um, uh, and I, I think it's important to, to point out the uh, 640 or 460 little I2 language uh, and a couple of the words that are used in there. Uh, one of the words is party. Well, party is a party to the action in this case. And also the declarant, and that's the person who makes the statement. And so if you read it with that in mind, uh, it states, as against Davey, a statement which would be admissible if made by Davey, Adam, or Nicole, at the trial, depending on which one you're talking about. Uh, if Davey and Adam or Nicole, or Davey, I guess, were participating in a plan to commit a crime or a civil wrong, and the statement was relevant to the plan or subject matter and was made while the plan was in existence and before its complete execution or other termination is admissible at trial, uh, it doesn't speak to who testifies at trial. It says nothing. And in fact, if you look at the cases throughout the year, you have one where, um, where well, the latest one, uh, Lodgson, I think, was a statement made to the police about his discussion. Um, so uh, I don't think that the, the statute is concerned with uh, who comes to trial and testifies to the statements. And in fact, that person can be cross-examined by the defense counsel if they have a question of whether that person's being reliable, uh, being honest. And so you look at the prongs. Uh, had the declarant been at trial, the statements would have been admissible. 
all of these statements would have been miscible if, uh, if the declarant would have come to trial. Um, Davey, Nicole, and Whitney were part of the conspiracy. Uh, the statements were relevant to the subject matter at hand, the attempted murder of Dennis Davey, and uh, the plan was still continuing. At the, oh, go ahead. That's including the jail phone call. No, I would I would disagree. Uh, this court has actually um, had two cases, State versus Flynn and State versus Moody, where it has found that uh, statements made in order to cover up a conspiracy also fall within that exception. Uh, and I think both of those, both of those are cited in the briefs. So if we reach them, that's your argument. Yeah, you're saying we can't reach them because we don't have an adequate record. Right, First and time. and uh, that I don't think that was the focus of the uh, the petition for review. The focus was whether third party element, but even if you get past that and reach it, um, this court said that um, the cover cover up of the conspiracy also is included within the conspiracy. Was it was there a contemporaneous objection at trial that this was hearsay? My. When I was looking at it last night, uh, my recollection was that the state or the, the defense counsel argued or objected on confrontation grounds that they couldn't cross examine these people who made the statements. Although, I mean, that really doesn't apply to the text message from the defendant to Adam. I mean, she's there. If they want to put her on the stand, they can. Uh, well, I guess where I was headed is, is once the once the um, we've established that it's hearsay, what obligation does the defendant have with regard to exceptions? Why? I mean, in this case, the defendant doesn't need to negate the applicability of 6460 IA2. Uh, that's an exception. Why isn't that your burden as a state to say, yeah, this is hearsay, but, but it comes in? Because it was, well, this is why it didn't occur at the trial, because that wasn't the objection. I mean, this, I don't think the state or the court is required to, to read the mind of defense counsel at trial and say, oh, he's saying generally that I didn't get a chance to cross-examine these witnesses, but uh, we should just assume that, uh, you know, go down the list of hearsay exceptions and assume each one of them. You know, he didn't make a specific objection as to this. And in fact, I'm not, I'm not positive. I was trying to think of what the motion for neutral well, is. See, that bothers me. Why don't you have to go through the list as the state? If given, uh, I understand your argument that uh, you can't uh, have a head fake or uh, object to confrontation, then bring up hearsay. But if hearsay is on the line, why isn't the state required to prove the exception? And come up with the exception uh, instead of the uh, defendant have to say this is hearsay and none of these objections apply and, and this one wouldn't apply because this and this one wouldn't apply because of that. Because if you're asking for the right. exception, why don't you have to come up with a specific exception? Well, I'd first say that uh, to address these on appeal, it has to be a timely and specific objection. Um, I would also say that um, the defense has a duty if, you know, this objection's made, they have a discussion about this objection, and, uh, you know, related to certain areas of hearsay, and the defendant doesn't step up and say, no, that's not my, what I'm arguing. I'm arguing that, you know, 462I, or I2 applies. That's what I'm arguing, that conspirator exception doesn't apply. I mean, so they have some sort of a duty if, if the uh, discussion of the objection isn't going where they, uh, this, I guess the court and the state presumed he was going with it. Um, the only other thing I wanted to point out, uh, well, a couple things. First, uh, the state in its closing argument, and also I think uh, when this was being discussed, uh, pointed out that this they weren't even presenting this for the truth of the matter asserted. Uh, they were showing, they didn't really care what was being said as much as uh, the defendant's tone 
during these conversations with her daughter where she's not even worried, you know, talking about how the, de- or the victim was doing, you know, how she was so nonchalant. And that's in uh, her closing argument, uh, volume 10, page 47. Uh, so, uh, and that's what the uh, state told the jury. That's why we put it, this information on. Um, and also, uh, you know, if you look at the trial, the defense really, uh, it's questionable whether they even wanted these uh, phone calls out because the defense used them to their advantage in arguing in this case at the closing argument. Um, so, um, anyway, unless this court has questions. Any questions? Thank you, counsel. Thank you. I'll just touch on just a couple things very briefly for the court. Uh, the question of, and counsel cited to Moody. Uh, Moody also does discuss that, you know, one of the factors discussed in Moody is the first factor, and the court says that's satisfied here. Uh, this this individual, I think Woodward was his name, is a third is a third party. He's testifying about a statement that he overheard Mr. Rodriguez say to the other co-conspirator. So even though uh, I think Moody, uh, I cited to Moody as well. So Moody also sort of cuts both ways. It also supports my argument that that third party component is an essential component to this court's longstanding sort of approach in jurisprudence to this question of uh, the co-conspirator, uh, co-conspirator uh, exception. Um, How do you deal with the uh, preservation statement uh, from the state? I was about to say the hearsay objection itself, um, would I have liked it to be more specific? Sure, but uh, he does say, uh, this is during Mrs. Hirsch's testimony, um, he launches a, a series of objections through this um, trial counsel he says it's not, it can't be inferred as being any kind of co-conspirator statement. Um, it's completely unreliable. I think the statement that it's, you know, the argument that it's unreliable, I would say, goes to that question of that third party um, requirement. Um, as far as the idea that it wasn't offered for the truth of the matter asserted, then why bring it into evidence if you're not trying to prove that that's the case? Um, I, I think in, unless the court has any additional questions, I believe, I guess the, the question of, well, you could cross-examine the declarant, which is one of the things that were brought up originally, was, well, we had, we had and counsel, trial counsel does discuss that um, when he objects to Mrs. Hirsch's testimony. He says, well, I've got, this is a new statement. I don't, I, I don't that's not covered in her preliminary hearing transcript. So at least in this instance, no, he, he couldn't have cross-examined her. Um, so I, I suppose I think I've, I've covered everything that I need to at this point, unless there are additional questions from the court. The record on the phone calls. Yeah, the record on the phone calls, I think that's an all or nothing. Um, I've got one definite statement there uh, regarding the phone calls. The other thing, like as, as you discussed earlier, uh, Justice Johnson, that it's sort of, if there's a third party re- requirement, that third party, that's not, those aren't third parties. Those are parties. So regardless of what they say, they don't come, they don't come in. Um, so it's, it's really sort of inconsequential whether this court parses over the exact words of every single one of those phone calls or not. So um, just so I understand, you're saying that we can rule on the admissibility of the phone calls between two co-conspirators mm-hmm. regardless of their content, so the fact that they're not in evidence doesn't preclude our review on your all or nothing. Either it's a third party or it's requirement not. or it's not. Right. It's okay. just a question right. of law. Um, unless the court has any additional questions, I respectfully ask the court to reverse Mrs. Davies' convictions and order a new trial. Thank you for your time. I see none. Thank you, counsel. Thank you, Thank you both for your arguments this morning and this afternoon. The court will take this matter under advisement.